Great. Uh, thanks so much. And if people could mute themselves, that would also be great, except for Jeff, obviously, and me at the moment. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Melanie Buttle, and I am the principal of Peter Zosky College here at Trent University. Uh, we are gathered today, some of us are gathered today on the traditional territory of the Michisagig Anishinaabeg. We honor the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations, and may we honor those teachings. And one of the things, I'll, I'll shoot it into the chat in a minute, but one of the things I usually encourage people at any event we have uh, is to check out the First Peoples House of Learning website at Trent because it gives you a lot of great resources around this territory uh, that we are on, the relationships and the treaties on this territory, and some resources for um, where to learn a bit more, which is really helpful. So I will put that in the chat uh, in a minute. So I briefly want to say that NYing, um, the word means the way we speak together, and that is the name of the building that houses Zosky College. And uh, for those of you who have been to an NYing talk before, we take that quite literally and see these talks uh, as a really fun way to speak together and with somebody uh, that we bring in uh, as a guest speaker. We are really excited to have Jeff Hennessy, Dr. Jeff Hennessy with us today. Uh, Jeff was an Otonabee College alum. I think you started in 89 and is currently Provost and Vice President Academic and Research at Mount Allison University. But Jeff graduated in 92 from Trent with a Bachelor of Science uh, and a major in Chemistry and a minor in the commoner. And somebody asked me the other day what that meant, Jeff. And oh, I, no. I know. Uh, David knows. That's, Some other people on this call know. But yeah, I explained the commoner. Don't worry. It's still alive. Okay. Um, and Jeff pursued a second undergraduate, undergraduate degree in music at Acadia and spent several years as a freelance musician and contract composer before attending UBC for a Master of Arts in Music Theory and then U of T for a PhD in Interdisciplinary Musicology. He worked as a part-time instructor at Acadia before being hired as a tenure-track musicologist and, in a strange twist of events, director of the School of Music simultaneously, uh, a position he held for six years before becoming Dean of Arts um, for what was supposed to be a one-year term but turned into five years. And he is now in his third year uh, in the provost role at Mount Allison. Jeff still writes and records music, plays in a country band called The Sundries. Uh, his album "Waiting on Still Waiting on a Fix with the alternative pop group The Muddle has made nearly $30 in streaming royalties. I think if they changed the name to The Buddle, they might make more money. That's just, I've offered this to Jeff it. before, but yeah. Uh, and I will fully admit that I have known Jeff since maybe not quite 89, but I want to say since 1991, um, because I married a Trent uh, alum who was also an OC alum, and he knew Jeff back in the day. So uh, I knew Jeff when he was a chemistry student and got to see him perform before he went on to actually pursue music. So Jeff, welcome to our, um, our event. And I'm going to just say thank you for coming and the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh for this opportunity to speak to you uh, this afternoon. That's a great uh, introduction. I, I'll i admit I'm um, I'm doing this with some degree of anxiety. Uh, I mean, firstly, the name of this whole speaker series is a tad intimidating. I'm sure you've heard that before. So I'm going to do my best to be extraordinary, but I will be content with somewhat interesting if I can get there. Um, and I'm also aware that there may be people in the virtual audience who knew me best when I was a teen or at least in my early 20s, and that is mildly horrifying. But I'm going to assume we have all grown into being mature adults since then. I wish uh, I could be with you there in person at Trent. I'm actually in a hotel room in Ottawa right now. I'm at a conference for higher ed administrators on academic labor relations. And uh, honestly, in many ways, that's kind of a perfect metaphor for this talk, because there's no way that I could have predicted that I would ever be in this situation when I first came to Trent in 1989. So why not give a talk about that whole journey from a room with the Delta? Uh, when Dr. Buttle asked me to do this talk, uh, I was so grateful and really honored, and I gave a range of uh, options for talks that I could do, mostly about music-related subjects, because I have a stock of those that I can pull out when opportunities like this arise. Um, but she proposed that I spend this time, a little bit of time, discussing my own career after Trent, and suggested that it would be of, of interest to this audience. I couldn't honestly imagine a more boring subject at the time, but I trusted her, and I started kind of reconstructing that pathway on paper, and uh, and it was a little difficult. It presented a few challenges in uh, in translating it for, for an audience. Firstly, um, in my mind, there seemed to be no organizing structure around this whole journey. To me, it's always seemed rather random, so how is how would this be of help to anyone? And then I started kind of diagramming it out and realized um, there are some guiding forces along the way, which have their foundations actually in my time at Trent. So that made it more interesting and 
and, and relevant. And it's also kind of a story of setbacks and curveballs and nudges down different paths. In other words, kind of failures of a sort that then turn into something else. Um, but this presented another concern because while this is a story uh, of challenges that diverted and reshaped my all my plans and goals, I don't want to give any kind of impression that it's a story of resilience or triumph over adversity. It's it's a story of privilege for sure. I had some dreams when I was 17 at Trent and things turned out differently, but still great. That's that's a pretty good story. Uh, and it's also a story of seizing opportunities that arose even when I wasn't sure uh, I knew what I was doing. That's that's scary and maybe even a little bit brave, but it's still it's still in my um, opinion a privileged life. So to set the stage uh, a little bit, I came to Trent in 1989, as Melanie says, uh, which was certainly a different time then uh, than it is now. Uh, Trent, I think, had about 3,300 students then, a bit larger than we are at Mount Allison now, but uh, had a very similar philosophy, a primarily undergraduate liberal arts model uh, university. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a 25th anniversary entrance scholarship, and it was called that because Trent had turned 25 that year. And by contrast, Mount Allison was already 150 years old by that time. That's 183 years old now. So Trent was and is still a pretty young university, even in this country of, of relatively young universities. And that scholarship uh, was worth a total of $6,500, which covered four years of full tuition at the time. So the cost was obviously much lower then, uh, and therefore the level of accessibility was much higher, even though fewer people actually went to university then. So my generation had a level of privilege when it came to higher education that is different than students have today. And my decision to come to Trent seems like the least inspiring thing ever. I was born in Peterborough. All my extended family still live in Peterborough. Uh, we moved all around the country when I was a kid because my dad was in the military, but um, Peterborough was always the place that I considered my home during those years. On top of that, my dad went to Trent for a degree in chemistry and then went on to study dentistry at the U of T. And my plan was to pursue a degree in chemistry at Trent and then go on to the U of T for medicine. So a big departure from the old man. Um, but even though uh, this decision didn't require a lot of imagination, it actually was born of, of great inspiration for me. And it was very consequential in my life. My father's story is more one of resilience. He grew up quite poor uh, in Peterborough, didn't finish high school, uh, actually was kicked out of several high schools in Peterborough. I'm not going to mention their names. Um, and he was on his way to a kind of pathway uh, to a life of disrepute until he met my mother, Josie, who was a post-war immigrant from the island of Malta to uh, Peterborough. And he ended up uh, eventually getting married, having a couple of kids and working at the uh, the old outboard marine plant in Peterborough, which is has since closed, he used to make outboard motors. Um, and, you know, they were kind of surviving. And he was in line for a promotion in that company. But first, they said that he had to finish his GED in order to qualify. So he did that through a night school program that they, at the time they called manpower retraining, if you can believe. And, um, and he discovered that he was smart and then he had a real love of learning. So at the prompting of a, a friend who was a dentist, he decided to try out university. And luckily, one just happened to have opened in his backyard just recently. This was 1973, and Trent was only seven years old at that time. So he took a course in uh, biology, and he loved it, and decided to make a, a leap of faith and, and quit his job and go back to school full time. And this really had a profound effect on me as I was a little boy at the time. Um, and firstly, I, I will remember the, I do remember the, the palpable feeling of hope that descended on my family once that he had made this decision. This was literally a moment that changed all of our lives for the better. And in my family, hope became linked to a university education. And he also used to take me to the Trent campus as a boy. And it always seemed like this beautiful and peaceful refuge in my life and, and a real symbol of that hope. He took me to the labs that had just been built. Uh, and they seemed like these places where magic happened. And, and the subjects he was taking, physics and chemistry and calculus, they just sounded like wizard words to me. So it was understandable that, I, that I'd want to follow his path uh, to Trent and study science like he did. And that's what I did. So... Pretty straightforward up till that point, uh, but nothing would prove to be that simple because immediately I faced my first complication when I was at Trent. Because while I loved studying science and I really did want to be a doctor at the time, um, I also had this competing love of music. And throughout high school, it always balanced uh, both sides of my interests, music and science, and I studied both. Um, but at the time, I was taught to believe that science was for serious study and, and music was for fun. And this is partially because of you know the, the, my father's pathway got so off the rails that he figured I wanted to keep me kind of as straight as on a path as possible. So just do science, Jeff, this will get you something. Um, and it made total sense to me at the time, but it really was misguided. I, I should have you know, tried to find some way to incorporate both things into my studies. But that was my guiding formula at the time. Science, serious, music equals fun. 
Uh, and unfortunately for my studies, I tended to gravitate more towards fun in those years than I did to serious. So I did fine in my in my science classes, but I really did enjoy the social aspects of university and uh, and playing music became a part of that. And as if the gods were playing some kind of cruel trick on me completely randomly, I found an old uh, totally in tune piano in the back hallway in the tunnel area between autonomy where I lived and the science complex. And I still to this day do not have any idea what it was doing there. But I found myself on that piano every night for hours with nobody else around. And I played and I practiced and I sang and I wrote music. Uh, and I practiced more in those years than I ever had before. And I spent way more time on the piano than I did doing my lab reports or studying for my exams. And I actually used to sneak out to play during chemistry labs. So I'd set something up to cook for an hour, kind of like you do in the chem labs. And then I would be sitting there and instead of preparing for the next stage of it or taking notes, I just used to sneak out and play the piano. And several times I returned to completely ruined experiments. So this was a sign that something kind of had to change. Uh, I still love science, uh, but there was no sense denying that fundamental other kind of passion in my life. Um, and consequently, because of uh, all these distractions, the music and my social life, I didn't achieve the grades uh, to get into medical school, which is a blessing now, but it seemed like a major blow at the time and, and a bit of an identity crisis for me. But there was one other additional seed that got planted at Trent um, that would prove to be really crucial in my later life. Uh, whether out of arrogance or FOMO or just plain nosiness, I realized uh, that I like being in the room when decisions are made. I like leading people. I like empowering teams to accomplish things. I like policy development and I like public speaking. Uh, and I got elected to the Trent Senate in my second year. And then I became the president of Autonomy College in my third year. And through that, I learned about all the messiness of university governance, and it lit a kind of a spark of interest uh, for higher education leadership that would obviously smolder later in, in my life. But I decided after Trent, I did graduate, I decided to, to uh, test out music school. I thought, well, I'll just do a second degree in music. Uh, and my calculus there was that if nothing else, it would probably raise my grades so I could at least apply again to medical school and if I still wanted to do that. So I actually went to Mount Allison first, and then I transferred to Acadia because my fiance at the time was at Acadia. So I, I went to Acadia uh, and I did that for a few years uh, on, a, on a path towards a music degree. And I enjoyed this and my grades uh, did improve. But um, after a few years, I realized I'd spent at this time six straight years in undergrad and I was kind of burning out of school. So I made the decision to actually try being a working musician and a composer and songwriter and leave formal education, at least for the time. And this was pretty scary for me because the academic calendar had always given some structure to the year. And now I really had to make my own boundaries and goals. Um, and I got some regular gigs backing up other artists. I got a resident composer position with a theater company, which was great. I did some recording, taught a bit of piano, and generally was surviving in what I soon figured out was a difficult and pretty ridiculous business that I had very little control over. Uh, and it was also really solitary. And I soon realized that missing, uh, I missed being part of something, uh, leading a team or at least being part of one was something that I, um, that I really enjoyed and I missed. And my favorite moments during those years were working with the actors and designers and directors in the theater company and, uh, and creating uh, pieces together. And I also discovered this crazy phenomenon at the time where other people my age whom I knew had gotten jobs and money just magically was deposited into their accounts every few weeks. And this seems wondrous for, for someone who had been living off student loans and had been gig hustling for his whole adult life. Um, so I, this, is, this is probably the low point. Uh, for some extra regular cash, I decided... Um, I would try to get a part-time job slinging movies at Blockbuster. I figured I could rent movies behind the counter by day, take home the free ones at night because they sounded like because I love movies and and it uh, sounded like a dream to me. Uh, and I would do you know play in the evenings, uh, but Blockbuster wouldn't hire me, <laughs> uh, and and I couldn't blame them. I had never worked retail or done a cash sheet or really did anything other than go to school and and be a freelance musician. Uh, so this was maybe the lowest point career wise, although it, it did make me laugh even at the time, and it still makes me laugh to this day. Um, one other thing that happened during this time, uh, and it was a really positive thing that I decided to do was uh, was I decided to read as much as I could because weirdly I had done a whole degree. Uh, but focused so much on science by my own choice. I really, I could have taken humanities or social sciences uh, courses. I just didn't. I figured, again, I had the laser focus thing that I was just going to take science courses. So I hadn't read many books during my undergrad, um, which I think was a mistake. But again, it was a mistake of my own. So I started reading as much as I could. I read public science books, but I also read classic literature and music history books and contemporary literature. And I read a lot of Canlit. 
um, I read a lot of uh, Mordecai Richler and Margaret Atwood, and, and I read uh, a lot of Robertson Davies. And one um, group of books by Robertson Davies, the Cornish Trilogy, takes place at Massey College at U of T. And it reminded me uh, a lot of how I'm, much I missed universities. And the third book in that, the, the Lyra of Orpheus, features a character who's doing her PhD in music and working on an opera as her dissertation project. And all of a sudden, I realized this could be something. I could work in a university as a professor writing and teaching music and writing about music. I could have an actual paycheck and still be a musician. And it all seemed really romantic and also a kind of a goal that I, that I could work towards. So that's the point where I decided I would go back to Acadia and, and finish my undergrad. And then after that, I went to uh, UBC for a master's in, in music theory and in composition. Um, interesting, I also got married during this time, and my wife Erin uh, was also facing her own kind of form of career identity crisis. Um, she had almost the exact opposite story of me. She had originally gone to New York to study theater, uh, and then realized that the theater business was even worse than the music business. So she came back to Nova Scotia, and then became an elementary school teacher. And she did love teaching, but didn't see herself surviving in the school system for a whole career. So she did that for a few years. And so just because nothing in our lives could ever be simple. At the time that I decided to go back to, to school to study music, she decided to go back to school and become a dentist like my father. Um, the only problem was she'd never taken any science courses in university at all. She was an English and theater person and then had done education, never even taken intro biology. So all of a sudden, my science degree from Trent becomes now very, very useful because I literally taught her you know, every, all intro chem and physics um, to get her prepared to go back to university. I mean, we started literally like this is an atom uh, from the beginning. And um, so that worked. Eventually, she went back to um, she went back to school at Acadia to do science. Poor thing had to follow me to Vancouver to do science at UBC, which was a whole whole different um, world in, a, in undergraduate science there. Uh, but then eventually she was accepted to dental school. And, uh, and now she's a dentist living in Woeful, Nova Scotia, where Acadia is. So that science degree, um, that was the first time that it become, became very useful. It, it, would, it would also serve me well a little bit later, as you'll see. And then, uh, so I was in Vancouver living off of student loans, which is still crazy to me, and, uh, and doing my master's. And then and Aaron was back at Dow, so the other side of the country, completely doing dentistry. And in my second year at UBC, uh, this crazy opportunity presented itself. My former professor at Acadia phoned me out of the blue, and he told me he was planning to retire in December and asked if I'd come back to Nova Scotia to teach his courses starting in January. And of course, because Aaron was already back in Nova Scotia at Dow, this would be an opportunity for us to be together, and it would actually be a real job doing kind of what I wanted to do. And I hadn't finished my master's yet, but I figured I could write the thesis from Nova Scotia while teaching. And it really sounded too good to pass up. And it also sounded completely preposterous because I felt totally underqualified to be a professor. Uh, but on the other hand, it was it was the dream and it was starting to come true. Um, so I said, you know, like a lot of my decisions, I said, yeah, I'll do that and then figure out how to do it. And I thought it would be a true test uh, of whether or not this is what I wanted to do. So. January 2001, I walked in to teach my first class uh, in music at Acadia and and really never looked back, except for that one moment. I, I walked in with my, my I had a set of CDs at the time and, and music scores and books, and I set them all down at a table in front of the class that was already in there. And I, I looked out to this class of first year students. I'm 29 at this time, and you know, so they're they're 18. So we're not that far apart in age. And I just looked at them and went, oh hell no, I can't I can't do this. And I turned around literally and I walked out and I and I walked around the building terrified and tried to muster up the courage to come back. So I did that. And uh, but then I taught my first class and it uh, it totally changed my life. I, re I remember almost every moment of that class to this day. And I knew that day that I'd be part of a university faculty for the rest of my career. It was such an exhilarating and confirming moment for me. And it really solidified that goal. So finally, uh, after this, I'm, I'm turning 30 that year. I, I realized, OK, I have a real clear plan. And at the thought at the time was it would be pretty simple. I get my doctorate. Not simple, but, but still, it was a goal. Uh, get a faculty job. Also not simple, but it, at least it was a goal. And then and then have a great life from there. So uh, I taught a few years at Acadia, really did love it. And then um, I had heard that there was going to be some retirements on the horizon uh, at Acadia in the music school. So I thought it would be a good time to go back to school and, and work on a doctorate. Uh, and I figured that if I could at least partially complete it, I'd have a good shot at one of these positions uh, because of my experience working there already. So that was in my mind, it was really, really easy, really straightforward. 
Um, so I went to the U of T just like my dad had done 28 years before, and I started uh, a PhD in musicology. Um, Aaron had just finished dental school by this time, which she had done through the military, like my father. I know it's such a weird story. I kind of married my dad and, uh, and she was posted to Ontario. So it worked out well for me. Uh, she could, she could work doing this job and I could go to school. And, uh, we, uh, just had a young, he, my son had just been born that year, six months before it was actually during Aaron's final exams, which is, which is unbelievable. Um, and, uh, but it was going to, it sort of felt a little bit stable Like she had a job. I was you know, studying. We got a house in Ontario with our new baby. Um, we thought we'd stay there until I finished my doctorate. And then by that time, she would have finished her military service. It would all work out perfectly. And then uh, I, then we'd figure out where we were going to land. And it would probably be wherever I, I was able to get a job. But again, <laughs> life has other plans. Nothing's ever simple. Um, in the middle of my first year of my doctorate, I got word that a faculty position at Acadia had opened up in music theory and composition, which is just perfect right in the ballpark, uh, except that it was way too soon for me. I wasn't even finished my first year in my PhD, um, but they encouraged me to apply. And so I did. And I, and I actually got the job. And then and then I asked them if I could defer it. <laughs> I said, well, I, I can't take it right now. Can I defer it for a year or two? And they said, no, of course, of course you can't defer it. What are you thinking? Um, so then I had to make this crazy decision. And at the time, uh, and many people thought it was outrageous, but I, I turned down the position. And, and, you know, in this world, that's a bit like winning the lottery and saying, no, I won't take the money now. I'll just buy a ticket in a few years and, you know, hope to get the, you know, the money when I'm ready for it. Um, so it was a bit agonizing, but I, I just knew I wouldn't be able to take on a role like that so early in my doctoral studies. And I didn't want to be away from my family and they couldn't leave. So that made the decision easier. And it was, I was gambling probably pretty safely that it wouldn't be the last opportunity that I would ever have. And um, if it wasn't at Acadia, then we'd be okay settling someplace else. Then eventually I, I got really lucky and another position opened up at Acadia, but it was a few years later. And um, this one was not as simple though. It, it came with a strange twist to it. There had been an external review done of the music school, and uh, and it was not a positive review. Uh, this there had been two successive presidents that had threatened to close the school down because it was not thriving, and uh, enrollments were down. Uh, curriculum hadn't been hadn't changed in years, um, so they determined that one of the ways that they would try to fix this was that the next vacant position would also be a search for um, a new director of the school of music. So if I wanted to apply for the faculty position, I also had to apply to be the director. And remember, this is this is less than 10 years since I was turned down for a job at Blockbuster, and I still had never had a continuous career job at this point. So now I was applying to be basically the department head of music at Acadia in my first ever tenure track position and my first real ever career job. So it's really ridiculous. But my thought was, well, again, I might as well apply and see what happens. And then if I miraculously get the job, uh, I could be the director for a few years, help shape the school into a place that I'd want to work for the rest of my career, you know, get it back on track and then see what happens. And as, as I said before, I always kind of like the idea of being in leadership roles anyway. So, so ridiculously, I applied and I got the job and then I had to figure out how to actually do the job. And this proved to be difficult. Um, you know, the number of things that were stacked there were numerous there was I still had to finish my doctorate first of all um the department was in quite a bit of disarray uh, Acadia itself was enduring at the time a near Laurentian like financial crisis I mean there were there were there was one point where we weren't sure we were going to make payroll it was really really scary uh we had just had a young child Aaron had a stressful job um I was also untenured <laughs> for most of this time they hired me as an untenured department head and uh, and and lecturer until I finished my my doctorate so it was just cruel um and I was leading people who used to be professors of mine who now had to adjudicate my performance in my tenure applications later while I was signing off on their budget asks it was it was it was a completely unfair development in my life I say that I mean it was still a great opportunity but it was just it, there were so many things stacked against success and it actually um it took a toll on my health a little bit at the time I developed this really debilitating uh, case of vertigo and it lasted a long time far too long and uh uh even that kind of had a silver lining of sorts I mean as horrible as it was at the time I, I mean I actually couldn't read and I couldn't look at a computer so trying to finish my doctorate and trying to I was teaching music and trying to administer a department and um, answer emails and things. It was, it was almost impossible. 
So I had to had to deal with that for many months. And once we ruled out the more dire causes like MS or, or a brain tumor, we realized that it was probably being caused or at least sustained by anxiety. So I actually sought out uh, therapy. It was the only only kind of recourse that I could have to, to try to help with this. And it, and it really helped. And eventually that went away. But that actually proved really pivotal in so many ways because it helped with learning about boundary setting and mindfulness and separating myself from the role that I was performing, which made it a lot easier to make more difficult decisions. And then I also learned about empathy and relationships and conflict management. And all of these became foundations for my leadership work in this role and beyond. So that was really actually a good a good development, even though it was really painful at the time. And it was exhausting um, six years, but it was also really fulfilling. We were able to uh, accomplish some significant things. Uh, I was lucky that I was able to bring in some new, new people and that, that helped. And some other people retired, which also helped. And together we wrote we re rewrote the whole music curriculum twice. Um, we increased enrollment, uh, improved the workplace culture. We improved the student culture, which is really important. Uh, we had this great conference that Scott attended, uh, hosting the um, uh, Society for Popular Music, which was really fun. Um, so at the end of that period, it, it kind of felt like a job well done and it felt complete. And it felt like time to step away for at least for a bit. And personally, career-wise, I, I achieved tenure and, and um, was promoted and uh, and then completed that term as director. And that after that came this wonderful administrative leave, which is kind of like a sabbatical for administrators. Um, and during that time, I thought I'd just plot my return to full-time teaching and, and research again. I started calling it the year of Jeff and then uh, um, and had all these plans. And then again, <laughs> life throws another kind of strange curveball. Um, I, I was on my way to, or just about to leave for Indonesia uh, for a research trip where I was going to be studying uh, Indonesian gamelan uh, in Java for for three weeks and doing some field work there. And I, this was going to kickstart my my uh, research program again. And the night before, literally the night before my my plane was to take off, I got a call from the dean of arts, and he told me he was going to be seconded to the provost office at Acadia for a year and asked if I would be dean for the next year, which again, seemed preposterous. And I immediately just said, no, I hadn't even been a full-time professor for seven years by this point, And now he wanted me to be the dean. But again, he made, he was very convincing. Um, he made the case that just try it for a year. And if you hate it, you never have to do it again. The same, same kind of thing, just, you know, give it a shot. Uh, and again, you know, I had this pull towards leadership and and um, we had had a fairly new president at that time who, who was doing really good things, I thought. And I thought I'd, I kind of wanted to work with him a little more closely. And you know, wanted to be in the room when the decisions were being made. We had this difficult work we needed to do to try to get through this financial austerity period. Um, so I accepted the challenge. And again, that one year turned into five years and I ended up doing a full term as dean. And that job was uh, maybe even more challenging than the music position was because the arts faculty was made up of very talented people, still is, but there were, had been a significant loss of trust in leadership and a lack of confidence in the institution, which had developed out of the whole austerity era that we were still in at the time. Uh, so my main focus in that position was just trying to restore a sense of hope. It was, all, it was kind of the only key thing, restore a sense of hope in the faculty, focus on the people and their relationships, let the results kind of flow from that. Um, and so five years later, a lot of exhausting work, and, and I felt like we got into a pretty good place. There were some new ideas germinating, some faculty renewal, and then maybe we had even achieved this new sense of hope. So that was, um, again, hard, but it was, but again, fulfilling. And again, I was at the end of something and was getting tired again. I, and I thought maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe I've done, you know, my bit in administration. I couldn't see where, where else this would lead really. But uh, Acadia had just recently hired a new president at well, the time I had finished. And, uh, and then there was going to be a search for a new provost. And I was the senior dean at the time. Uh, so I was the, the, you know, possible or likely internal candidate for that role. I initially just resisted it. I thought, no, I don't want to do that. I've I've done everything I can. I need some time to just relax from administration, go back to teaching and research. But um, but in this case, I also had some concerns about the direction the university was taking, and I was encouraged uh, by some people to apply. So I decided that if I don't apply, I might regret it later. If I apply and I don't get it, that's fine. If I if I if I don't apply, I'll, I'll regret it. So I went through that process, which was 
rather long and painful being an internal candidate for a role like that is the worst thing ever um all the externals look like stars and the internal is forced to defend a record of leadership in my case 11 years which invariably comes with some unpopular decisions um so in the end i came second and i and i didn't get that position and it was it was actually kind of heartbreaking uh during that whole search process i realized that the role was something i really wanted to do and it had taken me almost 20 years to fully realize uh, but the compulsion to be in leadership and to be in the room when decisions are being made finally fully hit home just at the point all of a sudden where I was out of administration and I'd been felt rejected by the university that I'd given my career to. So uh, this was a kind of another crisis of sorts because um, I'd finally realized what I wanted to do, what fulfilled me the most and what I really considered that I was best at, even though I had always said, I don't want to be best at that. <laughs> I'd rather be best at being a musician or best at being an artist or best at being a researcher or best at being a teacher, but not best at being an administrator. That's the thing I didn't want to be good at. But um, but I realized that's the thing that I ended up growing into. And now I had no opportunity left to do it. So I had the alternative, which was teaching and doing research and playing music for the rest of my career. And those were the things I originally set out to do, but I realized my path had permanently shifted. I was now a higher ed leader forever and had no outlet for it. So then I did something I thought I'd never do. I began looking outside of Acadia for work. And uh, that wasn't simple. My son was in grade 10 at the time. My wife still has a successful dental clinic in Wolfville, so I couldn't expect them to just follow me anywhere. So I needed to find a university that was nearby. And fortunately, the Maritimes has a lot of universities. So I began looking around to see what was out there. And it's really lovely serendipitous moment happened in the summer of 2019. Uh, Rory, my son, and I toured Mount Allison University campus because he was interested in going there. They have a, we have a program in um, aviation and my, and my son's always wanted to be a pilot since he was four. So we went for a tour. He was in grade 10 and I kind of got to see the campus through his eyes. And it was amazing. I could tell he had that same sense of wonder that I had experienced as a kid when I came to Trent. And at the end of the day, he was so cute. He said, dad, I can really see myself here. And I said, yeah, I can really see myself here too, buddy. Cause I knew that the position of provost was coming up uh, that later that year, they were gonna be doing a search for it. And Mount A is a really similar university to Acadia and what, to what Trent was like when I was there as a student. Um, and it's only two and a half hours from Wolfville. And the bonus was that he intended to go there in a few years. So, so I applied. I came to, uh, to the Mount Allison campus for my interview on March the 10th, 2020. <laughs> uh, and I was asked to give a talk on emerging trends in higher education. So I talked about all the usual things we are all facing in Canadian PSC. I even predicted that a university in Canada would fail or come close to that in the next few years with apologies to Laurentian. Um, what I did not predict on March 10th, 2020, I didn't even reference it, was the pandemic. I didn't even talk about it. Uh, three days later, everything shut down, right? The, I, the job that I was going to be applying for now had this added dimension of leading through a global pandemic. And I thought there's no way they're going to hire me. I couldn't even predict the virus that was going to close us all down in three weeks. Um, but thankfully, for some reason, they saw past that and, uh, and I was appointed to the role. And on uh, July 1st, 2020, I left Acadia to join Monet. And that's where I am now. And it's maybe the most peace I've had with any of the places that I've landed. It's a challenging job, but it also feels like the culmination of everything that came before. Um, and when I was a student at Trent, there's no way that I could, could have predicted any of this path. But looking back, despite how winding that path was, it does seem less random now that I've that I've kind of figured it all out than it felt at the time. Uh, even before I came to Trent, I was inspired by the transformative power of higher education. It fundamentally changed my family and my life, and I've seen it change so many lives in my career. And Trent was the first place that truly felt like another home to me, a place where I felt that I belonged. Uh, and I feel that way about universities in general. I've now been a student at six of them in Canada, and I've worked, including TA positions, I've worked at four. And to me, they're all still places of wonder and possibility, and I still believe in the power of these institutions to impact the future. So this world has become, but also probably has always been part of my soul, even though I originally had other plans for myself. And at Trent, I learned about leadership and governance. I learned how to live and work with other people to empower them to want to achieve great things. I learned about social justice and social issues. I learned about compassion and empathy and privilege. And also, of course, I learned science. And that not only gave me the ability to analyze data and think logically, 
But being a provost, it was been, it was great to have firsthand knowledge of the undergrad science experience, despite the fact that I later pursued an artistic uh, pathway. I know how to talk to scientists about their work. I know what science students are experiencing in their classes and in their labs and in their exams. Um, so that's really, really helped me and it's helped give me a little bit of a legitimacy in, in this role as a VPA. Um, and at Trent, I also rediscovered music uh, and following that passion um, has given me almost everything in my life. And it taught me about team and ensemble dynamics. It taught me about improvisation, which is a very useful skill in higher education leadership and engaged listening, another very useful skill, creativity and performance, both genuine and, and generous performance, all of which I use on a daily basis. So this uh, a long and winding career is fundamentally based on being grateful for all of these new learning um, and new opportunities, all the new knowledge and all the new skills that kind of presented itself and not getting too hung up on where any of that learning and experience led me or, or would lead me. Um, and right now, in this moment, I can't honestly tell you what's next or if there is anything next. There's no next stage in the plan for me because ultimately there really is and was no overall plan except for being open to whatever's offered, having the gratitude to accept that as a gift and being confident that no learning is ever wasted, even if it doesn't lead to a goal for which it was intended. So that's my story. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Jeff. Yeah, everyone's kind of clapping and commenting in the chat. You can always unmute to ask a question. Thank you. I was actually thinking as you were talking about if I could have predicted any parts of your long and winding road from having met you when you were in your undergrad. But the only thing I can think of is that everybody who knew you knew that you were very passionate about music and that you were, yeah. the chemist, you were the chemist that played music all the time. Right. So, um, I don't think that that's actually that surprising to, to many of us <laughs> yeah. who knew you then, right. You were really, really into music and we knew it and you knew it. And it's just so, and, and we also knew, uh, I'm going to say this too. We also knew that you weren't going to stick with science. I mean, you were pretty, <laughs> like you were still talking med school in a very cheery way, but I know. It just didn't. Yeah, I feel like we could have predicted that part, but on your yeah, last, my, my you friends know, are way ahead of me than yeah. uh, than I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, you had. I love what you said at the end too about all of the skills and all of the pieces then make you really good at higher ed because you've got both sides. And I think many of a uh, many of you are thinking this that you you know we all say humanities degrees and going into the humanities is useful powerful stuff it's not that often that you hear someone who switches to that side it's, that's right so yeah. I quite enjoy that I love that <laughs> um, that's great to hear but thank you that was amazing and I'm gonna oh, thanks. just look at the floor for some questions before I keep talking sure Michael go for it you're off mute <laughs> you, you saw that, right? Um, Jeff, Jeff, great, great story. And as you know, at Trent, we really value an interdisciplinary education, and you certainly spoke to that. And sometimes students have a lot of pressure on them at 17 years old to choose their career pathway from that point. And obviously, at Trent, we take a different approach. Do you, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, and it's and it's getting worse, right? It's it's there's so much pressure. Um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, the, the cost of education is, is, is so much more. Um, and then there's, you know, there's so much, uh, there's so much noise in the media around the value of a, of an undergraduate degree. Um, and, and it is a bit more of a quick, uh, solution to, to, you know, to their life. Um, but at 17, you know, like, I mean, I'm a perfect example of that you just, you just don't know, except for my son, who's always known what he wants, wants to do. It's just, it's pretty rare. I mean, he has, has this incredible sense of peace that I don't see in other undergraduate students uh, starting out that, that are, you know, that are feeling like the, the pressure of the number of students who are defaulting to taking subjects that they, you know, really, really probably aren't interested in. I mean, we have a, we have a program in business where we see a lot of students that, that we have some students who are interested in absolutely, but some students are taking it as a default and then they take, um, you know, their religious studies course in their first year as their uh, distribution credit. And then they, they just fall in love with that. And then, and then we tell them, you know, this is, this is actually a pathway. The, the, uh, you know, the BA degree is a pathway to so many different possibilities and, and, and career options. Uh, if you think about it the right way, and if you figure out the skills that you're achieving and you're, and you have a way to articulate them. Um, and so we're working really, really hard with, with students on that. And the same, and the same with students, um, in science, I mean, we we again we we try to make our science students like a trend. Try to have them uh, have more interdisciplinary opportunities. Um, uh, 
they all have to take humanities and social sciences and arts credits, um, just as a way of being able to, to make them more well-rounded. We brought in a new health studies program this year that's a Bachelor of Arts and Science because we want to we want to be able to inspire future health professionals to have to have that balance. I mean, if I had had that <laughs> degree when I had uh, opportunity when I first came, and actually when I first came to Trent, I could have done something like that because the ability to double major in in you know disparate things at Trent was always an option. I was just never advised as a as a seventeen year old kid in my family that that was something that would be of any value. So it is it is difficult, but I you know I do I do try to encourage people to not get too hung up on those years as being the years that are going to be the defining thing for what you do for the rest of your life because it's it's a long life ahead and uh, and again you know you never know what what exciting thing you're going to take in your degree that's going to set you off on a pathway. Very similar to the messaging we are still giving at Trent, I think Jeff, and probably foundationally, uh, as you said a similar philosophical approach at the universities that you've worked at, but possibly that you are helping influence. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Kat just said we recently developed a health humanities specialization. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. We're doing similar kind of seeing that foundational breadth of the, of the humanities and how it, how it brings more experience. Yeah. Kat. Hello. That was a lovely ch chat. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to, uh, a recent humanities grad, um, and I very much uh, touched with, we were saying that all the music and everything like that, and like staying connected with everything that um, you had, and also like the, the pull towards leadership and um, the connection to wanting to be in the room where decisions are being made. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any tips for like, I, I apologize, I might be the only, like one of the more recent grads on, on the call, like asking for this question, but like in regards of um, like remaining engaged with academia and like keeping that connection because you were saying that you were missing that like missing that like connection into those communities and that decision making just wondering if you have a suggestion for a recent grad to like remain engaged with those communities and that like that access to academia yeah i mean um i mean beyond besides keeping studying which is which is obviously the obvious the obvious way but um but certainly uh you know as an you know as an alum um i think you have a really uh powerful voice that you can contribute to to students uh coming up and and trying to keep engaged with the your alumni association uh volunteering um on on committees or or being part of mentorship programs for for young students uh and trying to keep engaged with what's what's actually happening in, in the university because as a as especially as a recent alum um you know i think the university needs to keep to keep hearing what's what the experience are of, of, of recent grads really interestingly we just as a, a bit of a side um we did a this survey of alumni, well, we did it of faculty students and, and alumni and trying to kind of distill down what the goals are of a Mount Allison education and um, and seeing if there was a difference between what the what the you know the older alumni versus the new alumni uh, versus what students would faculty would kind of consider. And, and, and it really all they all kind of agreed on those the same. 10 or 12 goals, which are really kind of foundations of liberal arts uh, programs, uh, you know, communication skills and analytical problem solving skills and community and, and that kind of thing, leadership. Um, and uh, and and it was interesting, like the this, the the recent grads uh, really got it, like they really got the message, but they had a lot of interesting, you know, things for us to, or perspectives on how uh, we could do that better, or we could do that to, we can still do the same thing that we, that we, that we value and that we're doing, but that we could do it in a way that is going to be more impactful for, um, you know, for those students. So I think that's, that's one way. Um, and certainly, you know, if, if, if universities are a place that uh, you feel yourself belonging to and that, and that you want to stay involved with, um, you know, there will be there will be positions coming up at universities in, in one way or the other, whether they're in staff positions in student services or, uh, you know, as a recruiter or uh, or, as, or or that kind of thing. Uh, and there are ways of being able to get into the university at a certain level. And then and then many people stay. It's interesting because as you were as you were talking about that, I'm looking at the chat where everyone's talking about all the programs we offer at Trent that have this nice interdisciplinary mix. I think the hard part is when we're talking, and I'm sure you find this, Jeff, when we're talking to prospective students and parents and really trying to articulate that message that these things are valuable parts of a well-rounded education. And I'm thinking about your exact example of your dad, right? You better stick to the sciences, son. Like, yeah. we have, I mean, we're, we have success, obviously, and you can point to many people, but it is a, speaking of the long and winding road, it's hard to get those young, young people and their parents 
to understand how that's going to benefit them. Yeah, it really is. And, and I actually, you know, I'm, uh, I don't say this. Well, I do say it. Um, Cause at the end of the day, the, uh, the undergraduate degree um, in my mind, the program matters less than the environment that you're in. The school matters a lot. Like where you decide to actually do your undergrad to me is really, really pivotal because um, it has to match with, with, you know, who you want to develop as a person. Um, so, you know, Mount Allison is not for everybody, right? It's not, it's not for somebody who wants to live in a city. It's not for somebody who wants to be more anonymous. I mean, you can't hide at Mount Allison. We only have 2,300 students. It's impossible to, to, to be anonymous. Um, yeah, so, you know, you can go to Mount Allison and take, you know, it's just like a trend. You can take any range of programs and you're probably going to do well. You're probably going to develop uh, as long as you're doing something that you're passionate about. I mean, finding the passion and the interest and something you can be successful at and learn how to be successful and learn through failing how to be successful. Um, then I then I don't know that it really matters what the at the end of your degree, what you know, what the subtitle of your degree is in terms of what that program was. Um, so, but that's really difficult. Like it's, it's almost impossible to get that message out there because the number one thing that students say that they're, that we're, we're, or that they're choosing a university over is what program is being offered. So we have, we have a problem with that at Mount A because our, while we've, while we've tried to incorporate more interdisciplinary programs, we are really, um, you know, very traditional in terms of liberal arts sort of focus of things. So, you know, when we bring in new things, we don't have the ability to build new buildings. We don't, we can't hire armies of new faculty. Um, we don't get lots of funding to be able to, to start new things. So we're trying to find ways of repackaging or, or making more interdisciplinary connections among the, the programs that we have um, without trying to um, just simply cater to whatever's, you know, the latest, the latest sort of fad. And it's, but it's difficult. It's difficult for us to, to remain small. I mean, Trent, I'm sure had a very difficult, I don't know that you would have survived remaining as at the 30, 300 students or whatever it was when I was a student there because of the the landscape in Ontario we we worked really hard at it but it, it's certainly not easy and it's um you know every year we're trying to figure out you know how we're going to incrementally uh get closer to survival yeah that's for sure challenging Scott you were I'll go I'll come back to you Kat in a second I just saw Scott about to go there sure I was I was going to pick up on your your talk a bit about breadth and I mean we talk about it academically but I think you opened with it like I, I could phrase it as a question or a statement but how important was the commoner and it's really oh yeah you know, like I, I don't remember you know I was at trend 84 to 88 I can't say I have that many deep memories of my classes though I obviously did learn something in that time but I remember you know certain events that took place whether they were at the commoner or the Cayley or they were you know we had such a litany of amazing guest speakers in the 80s from Canadian literature who would come and read from their work and, and you know and talk or film nights that took place like how important is that for what you end up doing later on in your career and not just the in-class stuff that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, that's a great question, because for me, that was, uh, you know, if not, well, it was probably more important than, I mean, certainly, you know, the classes were important, and certainly the studies that I was doing, it helped me be a, help learn how to be a student. But in terms of developing as a person, um, those experiences, whether it was the social stuff at the the, the commoner, or we had the, the cat's ass at the time, um, or whether it was the events that were happening on campus. I mean, I mean, even just, um, even just learning about, I, you know, growing up in military bases, I had a very sheltered kind of idea of what people were like. I, I had never, you know, learning about social justice and social issues. Trent was a very activist uh, student campus at the time. And everybody was, we were protesting everything. And it was kind of cool just to be a part of that. And it was legit, like real good activism, not just, you know, slanging stuff on Instagram. It was actually, you know, thought out, well-organized uh, activism. It was very inspiring getting to be a part of various levels of student government and, and actually being involved in decision-making. Um, you know, the Trent, I don't know if it still is, but the Trent Senate had a lot of students on it. We used to, we used to caucus as students and, and try to influence policy. Uh, we had a strike in 1992 that I'll never, I'll never forget the students being involved in trying to figure out what the after strike protocol was going to be like. All of that was, was, uh, was incredibly important to me. And I also, um, when I when I left residence, uh, the, my final two years at Trent, um, I lived in a house on um, Water Street with five women, 
And uh, it was the most amazing experience. I mean, I had to, I had, I really had to learn how to live with women. I had to learn how to live with people. Uh, they taught me a lot of things about, about the way I should be and, uh, and about who I became. And, uh, you know, all of that was a part of that development. And, and so I think it's, I mean, I think it's a really good point that putting so much emphasis on, you know, which courses you take or what, or what your program structure is at the expense of those other things, I think can impoverish your experience. And, and so finding a place where you can feel like you can have all those experiences that fit you, I think are really important. Melanie, Steve, um, Jeff, that was that was terrific. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I I joined. I'm I'm a, a alum and supporter of Zosky College, and uh, and I, I joined on this because my story is somewhat similar. Although I left university after the first year to follow my dream in music, oh, wow. and uh, and uh, didn't go back until 1998 part time. So Amazing. like 20, 20, 25, a long time later. Um, but, but, but after, uh, the, after I was in music for a long time, the same experience as you, like, it's not a, you know, it's not a place for sissies and the pension is not too good and on and on and on. It's really hard to see how you make a, a living in it. Um, and, and I ended up working, uh, working for a political party and I didn't really like partisan politics, but I ended up through that as a civil servant. Mm, okay. And so I guess it, it, it's an observation and a bit of a, a point, and it's something I try to can say to my daughter as well. Like, you just don't know when the eureka moment is going to be. There is no way when I was 20, dropping out of university to follow a, you know, Frank Zappian rock and roll <laughs> pathway, <laughs> playing kooky music to 37 people at the Elma Combo downstairs. There is no way that I was going to cool. say my dream job was a gray-suited bureaucrat. Yeah. Uh, but it turned out to be what I did for 30 years. And I yeah, loved yeah. every bit of it. I yeah. loved being behind the scenes, uh, uh, finding consensus, solving problems, fixing things in a way that I just had never been able to do before. Um and and your point and Kat also brought it up the I, the notion of also being at the center of where decisions are made is a real driver. Yeah. And yeah. you sort of don't know that when you're 17 or 20 or whatever. You just don't know that that makes a difference. Having control, whether you're a manager or a, I ended up as a deputy minister, but whatever level you are, that having control of your life. <laughs> and of your sort of environment around you is absolutely one of the essential things. And, yeah, yeah. you know, there's not exactly a course on that at university. Right. And so, so I, I do come back to like how in the university setting, when, you know, you have people from 17 to 21 to 24 or whatever, can you convey some of these things about there are still huge decisions yet to come that they don't even know how they're going to come how they're going to be made and that that's that's well, one of the big challenges of university yeah and I'm, I'm actually i'm sort of facing this in my personal life my so my so my son like i say he's wanted to be a pilot since he was four uh it's the only thing he's ever wanted to do he found he only applied to one university mount allison because it had a it had a, a combined aviation program with the moncton flight college and you can either do a science degree or a business degree at Mount A. It's it's our unicorn program for us. We don't have anything else like it. We have no other professional programs, but this one, this professor years ago decided to create it because he liked flying and, and everybody just kind of went, okay, sure. And I, and I think he got it through the Senate where half the people didn't show up. Like I think they were asleep at the wheel and they kind of passed it. Nobody thought this would go anywhere. And now it's become this big program that we're having to contend with, which, which is great. But um but he he is laser focused on this thing and and the curriculum is very very tight because you're trying to get your flight courses in but you're also trying to get all of your science or business courses in depending on what they are and there's not a lot of room for breadth and um now i'm sure i'm sure he's having a good social life so i think that piece of the breath i think is is working well but i you know i sat down with him and said you know we need to you you get a few electives like let's let's think about these you know let's think about like what are you interested in and so he's in a course in uh, religion and popular culture and he's doing a um, um music and society type course in the second semester and i think he's taking a course on cults and um and he's and he's loving this stuff and and i'm you know i'm trying to 
not that I don't want him to be a pilot or that, not that I, I want him to, you know, to, to face, you know, identity crises or anything like that. But I, I but I, again, I, what happens though? What happens if he decides, oh, I actually, that thing I thought I loved, you know, I don't really love anymore to have a little, to have the freedom or the space to be able to change your mind um, at, at that young age, I think is really important. So, um, so it's interesting because you, you would think that, you know, the, this, the stress that, that students face of not knowing what they want to do is real. Uh, but in, in many ways, in my opinion, it's actually a better situation to be in than to go in laser focused on something you think you want to do. And then, and then getting down that road and not, not having taken advantages of other opportunities because you were so laser focused on one thing. So it's, uh, but it's a hard message to try to convey because it really, and, and now we're seeing all this pressure, um, you know, some of the things that we're all having to contend with, like the idea of uh, shorter degree credentials or not even degrees of, you know, trying to figure out other other pathways to employment for for new students. And in, in, in my opinion, it's kind of missing the boat on what the real value of this time is, which is, which is developing uh, the, the opportunity to have a, a life, you know, a, not just a career, but multiple careers and an examined, an examined life and, and, uh, and a level of happiness and engagement with, with, um, with people and with ideas that will serve you for the rest of your life. But it's a very difficult message to, to get out there right now because there's so much noise that's uh, challenging it. But you, in a way, you are the proof that, I mean, you thought you had laser focus and you yeah. turned to other things and you don't regret that. So if I'm thinking about your son, I would say he will do other things as well. And he's already doing sure. other things. So you're a good example of like, it's also possible to do a right turn and it is, to come yeah. to that later. I mean, you just said you weren't reading fiction in your undergrad and that, yeah. that changed. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so thank, yeah, thanks for that, David. I'm going to go to Meredith and then I'll probably wrap us up, but it's been a great conversation. Meredith, go for it. Thanks. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Hi. Thanks so much for that. That was um, very inspiring. Um, I am in the midst of going through a career change. So I spent um, 10 years in marketing and I've recently gone back to Trent two years ago to the to become a teacher. I was oh, wow. with some kids a few years ago and I just realized that I just want to spend my career working with kids. Um, but sometimes, you know, the doubt creeps in that, you know, did I make the right decision? Should I go back to my old career? So I guess just what advice do you have if you've gone through the, a similar thing and for people who are having those sorts of doubts? Yeah, I mean, my advice is that, um, uh, you know, Obviously, you have to listen to your instincts, but but um, but there's a reason. Obviously, there's a reason why you made that change, right? Otherwise, I mean, if 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 you were, uh, you know, if you were happy, if everything was working in that previous career, it probably wouldn't have even came up as you wanting to do something else. So going back to it probably isn't probably isn't an option because it's probably not going to work out anyway, and you probably won't um, be the person that you want to be, be as happy as you can be. So, you know, the, the doubt and the challenges and, um, and, you know, you're going into a hard profession, but again, if you, I mean, all professions are hard to a certain extent. So if you're going into a, to a hard profession where you have a passion for it, um, where you can, where you can get past all of the, you know, the hard stuff and, and still find the love in it every day, then I think, I think you got to stick with that and, and also not be afraid for that not to work out because it might not. Right. And it, in, and in the end of the day, you know, chances are what you did in your marketing job is going to help you in your teaching job. And chances are, if you do something else, your marketing and your teaching work are going to help you with something else. I mean, I mean, you think about what you probably were able to do in marketing uh, in, in terms of the skills that you were able to, you know, that you learned or were able to develop or became really good at how those are going to help you as a teacher. So to me, that all all kind of runs together as a, as a connection. And no matter what you do, again, like if you just keep accumulating with a with a grateful and an open uh, approach to learning and developing new skills and new ideas and, and growing, then it, it's all going to lead towards something thing absolutely yeah it it reminds me of a of a story from a few years ago where a student said to me that he was sort of regretful that he'd done his degree because he really wanted to be a motorcycle mechanic and that is what he was going to pursue and I said why would why how could you ever regret the degree it may have led you to figure out that you wanted to become a motorcycle mechanic so it, absolutely it, it never wasted it takes you on the path which is kind of your whole point and I think absolutely you know the I, part of what you you shared I, one of the things I regret from my younger years and my many years of academia was that I worried more than I needed to about where I would end up. And I think you can spend a lot of time as a young person worrying about the perfect job or the suit or the pension, all the things that you and David were talking about too. And it just, it, it sometimes has its own path that will reveal itself to you and you can't plan for every piece. And that, yeah. I, I just regret worrying. I'm sure you do too, but like worrying about the next stage all the time. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and then, you know, and there were moments where, so, you know, being a, you know, being a freelance musician for those few years, it just did not feel like I could do that. I just, it just did not feel like something I could sustain. Um, not because it was too hard or not because there weren't moments of joy. It didn't feel like me. I was missing too many things. I was, it was too, it was too self um, directed and it was too solitary and, and I was missing out on things that I, so I knew at that moment that I had to make a change. Yeah. Um, other things, you know, even if they're even if they're difficult or if they're in doubt, or if you don't know the if you don't know the outcome, um, if you still you know are loving it, if you're still enthused by it, if you still if you can still see um, yourself in that in that, then I think it's worth you know keeping going because even if it doesn't end up like you think it's going to, it's going to end up in something. Totally. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your words. I think it resonates so beautifully with the Trent oh, great. liberal arts multidisciplinary audience. And we'll make sure that uh, career space at Trent uh, gets their hands on this on this recording. Oh, so awesome. I, want, I really want to thank you, Jeff, um, for sharing with us. It was really beautiful. It was great to see you again as well. You too. And I want to thank all of the people on screen uh, who spent this hour with us. And we will be back for another NYA on December 1st, I believe, with another grad. And the last thing is that it is Autonomy College's 50th anniversary. So Jeff, as an OC alum, I just wanted to just put that out there for all of you that we are doing many, we, not me, Jessica was on the call a few minutes ago, but she had to go, but the uh, Autonomy principal was on the call. And I know she'd love to chat with you more about OC's 50th. So oh, great. a little Hope heads up for all of you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank Thanks. you so much for having me. I really, this was really great. It was a great, uh, it was a little, nice little break from this conference too, which was awesome. And uh, right. uh, I can't wait to come back to Trent uh, at some point. Thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye.